Last week, Lamont, uh, who we just honored, uh, g- gave a great message. Man, is that guy a fireball or what? Huh? I, I shouldn't tell you, but he's older than me, you know? By, I think, like, what is it, three months or something like that? Um, but Lamont, I mean, man, that energy that guy exudes is fantastic. I love that energy. But Lamont, um, he uh, challenged us to persevere in three areas. And those areas were marriage, parents, and God. That was one, one part of his message. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up on that theme, specifically the theme of marriage. Because it seems like everywhere I go, I hear of people struggling in their marriage. Now, this is understandable considering that we've come through a global pandemic, right? I mean, a lot of people, um, they say, a lot of the studies are showing us, that there's an enormous amount of mental illness, emotional illness, that's been caused by all the dynamics of the uh, global pandemic that we've just gone through and that we're still dealing with uh, some parts thereof. But it goes beyond that. You see, I've especially noticed in some of the young married couples that they're struggling, right? They're struggling to have the kind of relationship they want to have. And, to, and, 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 and many of these couples are, dare I say it, uttering the D word. But God tells us that when we are bound in the covenant of marriage, that word doesn't belong in our vocabulary. Now, there are some reasons that the Bible tells us are acceptable. But most of the reasons people give are not the reasons the Bible gives. And so today, we're going to take a close look at this. As a matter of fact, um, let me share with you a letter that a young woman wrote. She wrote, Dear Pastor, When I first fell in love with my husband, I was sure, absolutely sure, that he was the right person for me. But over the years, as we've lived together through a lot of messy situations, I've seen many sides of my husband that I don't like. My feelings toward him have turned from respect and attraction to disappointment and sometimes even disgust. I now feel like maybe I married the wrong person. Why do I feel this way? And what can I do about it? Something has to change. So many marriages deteriorate in three stages. Uh, They start off with harmony, and then they move to hostility before finally ending in apathy. What causes them to go from harmony to hostility to apathy? Well, what causes them to sink? And that's how we're going to look at this. Saving my sinking marriage is what we've called this uh, message today. And by the way, some of you are sitting here today, and you're not currently married. Well, you'll still want to take notes, pay very close attention, because quite frankly, uh, you may find yourself married uh, uh, one day, married again one day. Some of you are younger, and you're thinking, well, I'm not married. What's this got to do with me? If you're younger, you're probably going to end up married one day. And others of you are sitting here saying, I got no problems. Me and my wife, we got it going on right? Well, that's today. Wait till tomorrow. Okay? Any of us who've been married for a few years, we can, we can tell you all about that one. All right? So everybody needs to take notes, take close notes. Um, uh, uh, if, if there was ever a time to take notes, it would be in a message like today. So I invite you to follow along as I use the analogy of an iceberg. You can see the iceberg up here, a uh, powerful picture. I love that. It shows how much of the iceberg is actually under the water, And it's a beautiful picture. I love this because, quite frankly, most marriage problems are not on the surface. They're under the water. So there's four icebergs, again, taking notes, four icebergs that cause a marriage to sink. And number one is unrealistic expectations. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Now, I don't know any other area of life, folks, where we have a higher or a more unrealistic expectation than we do in the area of marriage. I want you to think about all of the false expectations that are set up for us in our culture. First of all, if you're taking notes, this is letter A under Roman numeral one, Hollywood. Look at what Hollywood does. We've all seen the fantasy films, right? Where the knight rides in on the white horse, you know, in shining armor to take the damsel and they go and ride off into the sunset together. 
Nobody's coming for you on a white horse. Okay? And can I just tell you, if someone actually did, you wouldn't get very far because I-80's backed up all the way to Joliet. They just don't happen the way it does in the movies. It just doesn't. Let her be. The whole dating process is a setup. Have you ever thought about that? It's a setup. It is. You act in ways you would never act if you weren't dating someone. Men will say things like, would you like to go to the opera? What self-respecting man would ever say something like that? I don't know, except when you're dating. No man in his right mind would ever do that. Opera? Ugh. We do unnatural things. We buy things for strangers. You go into a singles bar, you walk up to a lady, you say, hey, can I buy you a drink? Who does that? What, you're walking through Home Depot, you see a lady standing there, hey, can I buy you a toaster? I mean, when you're dating, you are on your best behavior, and you just don't act normal. All these expectations are unreal and they're unnatural. Even the way we prepare for the wedding sets us up for enormous, unrealistic expectations. Have you ever seen one of those bridal magazines? Come on now, I'm telling you, they should be kept in the science fiction section because they have no basis in reality whatsoever, ever, right? Everybody's airbrushed. Everybody is. And on the day that she walks down the aisle, everybody knows she is never going to look that good again. <laughs> never. It's a bait and switch. To make sure that the bride looks really, really good, what do we do? We dress the bridesmaids up in those really weird dresses. Dresses that they'll never wear again as long as they live. And they got weird colors. But they make the bride look good. They make the bride look good. And then you finish the wedding by going on the honeymoon. On the honeymoon, you're supposed to do, go to this little paradise, right, that nobody can actually afford, where nobody ever gets mosquitoes, and nobody ever gets sunburned, and quite frankly, no one would ever get diarrhea. Now fast forward six months. What happens after that honeymoon? The newlyweds are sitting around the breakfast table. She's in curlers. He's sitting there in nothing but boxers. They both have morning breath, body odor, and are letting off obnoxious gases. And you wonder, what happened? He thought he was marrying Beyonce, and he got whoopy. She thought she was marrying Denzel, and she got a dumbbell. Since nothing in your entire life has higher expectations than your wedding and your marriage, nothing sets you up for a bigger fall. Nothing, more disappointment, more letdown, more what happened than what the wedding does for the marriage. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to write down something, okay? I told you you need to take notes today. If you, if you don't have something to write on, you don't have something to write, just pull your phone out. You all have notes on your phone, right? Pull up the notes and type it out on your phone. Write down something that was an unrealistic expectation. Let me give you my example, okay? I was a youth pastor when I got married to my wife, Ruth. And so my expectation for Ruth and me was very simple. We were going to hang out with teenagers, we were going to read the Bible, we were going to pray, we were going to have sex, and we were going to eat, and then repeat. Right? Hang out with teenagers, read the Bible, pray, have sex, eat, and repeat. Well, that was an obviously a wildly unrealistic expectation. So we're going to give you a few uh, moments here. Let's have a little music play. While well, you take a moment to think and write down what your unrealistic expectation was or what you think it might be. Let's move on to point number two. 
The second iceberg that sinks a marriage is unaccepted differences. Unaccepted differences. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Circle those words, should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You see, that phrase should go might better be translated in the direction of her natural bent. The direction of her natural bent. That means your personality. Everybody has a God-given personality. Differences, right? My wife Ruth and I, uh, I'm an extrovert. I know you all didn't know that. But I'm an extrovert. She is an introvert. All right? Those are just flat-out differences in personality, and they lead to lots of conflict in marriages because we think everybody should be like us, right? I'm the template. I'm the way it's supposed to be, right? So if you don't do it like I do, well, that's a problem unless you understand these differences, these personality types. Uh, That iceberg that will sink your marriage is unaccepted differences. We are different, But we too often neither recognize those differences nor do we accept them. In fact, we often resent those differences. Now, you've all heard the cliche, right? Opposites attract. Until you get married, then opposites attack. (laughs) What used to fascinate you now frustrates you. Now, this is interesting because God wired you in such a way that you naturally seek out people who will compliment you. God wired us like that. Structured people tend to find spontaneous people. Outgoing people seek people who are reserved. Why? Because we're different. We like that difference initially. At first, we're fascinated with opposites. But then when you spend night and day with them in a marriage relationship, you start to become irritated with those opposites. They don't do things the way you do. While dating, we overestimate what we have in common. I've heard it all the time. You get a young couple who's gone out for a couple weeks together, and what do they say? Oh, we have so much in common. Right? No, you don't. (laughs) No, you don't. (laughs) You may think you do, but you don't. In the first place, you're a woman, he's a man. And that makes you think in totally different ways, all right? I was reading the other day about how men during adolescence undergo the testosterone wash, right? Men have testosterone. Women don't have testosterone. And that testosterone wash, it severs many of the synapses in the head, separating the right hemisphere from the left hemisphere. So next time your wife says to you, what are you, brain dead? Look at her and say, yep. Absolutely, and God did it. God did it. Celebrate your differences and realize that God wants to use these differences in your life. Our Heavenly Father, He's got a great sense of humor. You need to think of it that way. God's got a great sense of humor. He puts opposites together and then says, (laughs) work it out, right? Work it out. I think He enjoys doing it. I really do. But He does it for a purpose. There's a purpose that He does this. How many of you are early risers, right? How many of you, come on, let me see. You like to get up early? You like to, yeah, yeah. Chances are, you know, those are, those are the larks, the ones that get up early. I almost guarantee those of you who are early risers married someone who doesn't believe in God before 11 o'clock. <laughs> larks almost always marry owls. Not always, but almost always marry owls. One of you in a marriage is daring and impulsive, and the other one is cautious and reserved. Why is that? Because we need both elements in our marriage. One of you loves to talk, right? Talk, 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 talk. And the other one, the person who just elbowed you, (laughs) is a little bit boring. How many of you love to spend money? I just love to go shopping, spend a little money, right? How about that? You married a tightwad. You married a penny-pinching, we got to squeeze every single red cent out of you, miser. One of you loves to cuddle. The other one is a porcupine. When it comes to sex, one of you is a firecracker and the other a dud. There was a, maybe you've heard this, a husband and a wife, um, you know, we're getting ready to go to bed together, and the husband came over, and he had a couple of aspirin, and he had a glass of water, he said, honey, here you go, I've got, uh, you know, here's your, here's your aspirin and water, and she goes, what's that for? He said, well, it's for your headache, and she said, I haven't got a headache, he got a gleam in his eye and said, gotcha. 
Now, one of you is neat. One of you is neat, and you're organized, and you're always on time. The other one's flexible, mellow, late. We, learn to accept, when we must learn to accept differences and not resent them. One guy told me, I knew I was marrying Mrs. Wright. I just had no idea her first name was always. <laughs> Do you know that God's number one asset in your sanctification is your marriage partner? And that's making it real right there. Did you know that God's number one asset in your sanctification, that's just a big word, a big church word, it means holiness. It means to make you like Jesus. God's number one asset in making you like Jesus is your marriage partner. God uses your husband. He uses your wife more than any other person in your life to help you grow spiritually. So, number two, please write down one way that your spouse is different than you, right? That you have a difficult time accepting. All right. Questions on the screen? Take a few seconds to write. Let's move on to question number three. I'm a little worried. I'm looking at my wife, and she's writing so fast back there. I think we might need a little marriage counseling. I'm not sure. Number three, number three, the third iceberg that sinks a marriage is unresolved issues. Did you catch that? Write it down, unresolved issues. Ephesians 4, 26, 27 says, Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, these are issues that keep coming up over and over and over, and they just never seem to get resolved. And I know that all of you who are married, who have been married, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It just, we just seem to keep talking about these things, right? And, 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 and for whatever reason, maybe you don't want to talk about them. Maybe it's just too personal. Maybe it's just too touchy. It could be finances. It could be sex. It could be in-laws. It could be kids and how you discipline them or don't. It could be communication and how you talk to each other. You don't want to talk about it, and so it has become off limits, and it becomes an unresolved issue that's always there like the iceberg underneath the water. Unresolved issues move a marriage from harmony to hostility. And from hostility, when bitterness creeps in, you're just a few steps from apathy. And according to Stanford Research, the Gottman Institute that's done more research on marriage than anyone else in the nation, they say apathy is the death of your marriage. So what does that mean? Are you arguing with each other? Woohoo! Good news! You're still good. <laughs> as long as there's emotion involved, if you're yelling at each other, I mean, you know, there's better ways to handle it, but hey, there's still hope, all right? Now, unresolved issues, I, I just said that, the worst <laughs> unresolved issues aren't the ones, this is so important, they are not the ones that are created in the marriage. Unresolved issues, the worst ones are the ones that you brought with you into the marriage. Things that you learned from your family growing up. All right? This is very, very, very important, right? But I just love it when somebody, I hear guys say this a lot, you know, they're talking about something and, uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll say, well, that's how I was raised. And I look at them and I think, do you not know? <laughs> No, nobody wants to be like you. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you don't know that, do you? Okay. Um, when, when, so when you got married, here's the thing, folks. You are not a blank slate, all right? If you, you're not tabula rasa, right? A blank slate. All of us carry baggage into our marriage. All of us do. Nobody is exempt, all right? If you think you didn't carry any baggage into your marriage, you are seriously deceived. And let me be the one to tell you, okay? Because I love you. 
right? My name's PD, and I love you, all right? I'm going to tell you the truth. So um, you can carry hurts into your marriage. You can carry habits into your marriage. You can carry hang-ups from your previous family. You can carry hang-ups from your previous marriage, The more pain you had, get this, listen now, the more pain you had in your family growing up, the more pain you have brought into your marriage. Simple as that. The more problems you have to resolve. Marriage doesn't create problems, it reveals them. Write that down. You can even tweet that if you want to. Marriage doesn't create problems. Actually, it does create some problems. But most of your problems are revealed in marriage, not made by the marriage. When you get married, you let somebody up close and personal into your life who sees all your hang-ups and all your faults, right? So if you're in, if you're in a married situation and you're getting all upset with each other and you know, one of you says to the other, what are you getting all up in my business for? Right? If they say, you need to say, because I married you. And that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to get all up in your business. I'm supposed to get all close to you. I'm supposed to get personal with you. I'm supposed to be the one who tells you things nobody else is going to say. Right? I mean, I tell you what, the greatest blessing in my wife is, a wife, is, is, is that my wife will tell me things I won't hear from anybody else. And can I tell you, sometimes I don't want to hear it. I really don't want to hear it. But I will tell you time and time again, I have walked away and I have thought about it. And I have said, thank you, Jesus, for blessing me with a wife who tells me what I need to hear, not just what I want to hear. Because I want to be like Jesus. And the only way we get to be like Jesus is when somebody tells us the truth about the things that we need to work on, the areas where we need to improve. Now, if that's the only thing you hear from your spouse, that's another issue. We'll talk about that another day. Hopefully you're getting some encouragement along the way. When you get married, like I said, you let somebody up close. They see your hang-ups. They see your faults. They see your weakness. And that's when your spouse says, God loves you, dear, and I have a wonderful plan for your life. You all not familiar with that phrase? That's an old evangelism phrase. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Wow, we need to do some evangelism work around here. That was really funny, so you know. Just so you know. All right, it's a delayed response, but I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it, okay? I, you see, I, uh, so, so, so what happens is, you know, she says, I see what's wrong with you, and I can help, so I will get started on a personal improvement program called Let's Change You. And while on the other hand, the other partner in the marriage, they hear that person say, let's change you. Their walls of defense go up, and they say, I'm not the one who needs changing. You're the one who needs changing. And it sounds like a couple of fifth graders having an argument. I've got a personal improvement program for you, the other spouse says. Let's change you. And when that happens, the walls are up and the sparks begin to fly. Some of you are still reacting to things from your past in the present. Maybe your parents, one or both of them were over controlling, or maybe they just didn't pay enough attention to you, or maybe they didn't affirm you enough. For whatever reason, you have these resentments that are down in your soul. You've got some anger, some problems. You've got grudges. They're stored up against your parents. Then you come into marriage, and every time your spouse says something that even remotely reminds you about that thing that you hated so much about your parents, that controlling, domineering, they wouldn't listen to me, the abandonment feelings or issues, whatever it was, it could be a hundred different things. You tend to take all that anger from the past, which you have never resolved, and you turn it and you focus it on the person you love the most. It may be an itty-bitty issue, but your spouse is thinking, where did that volcano come from? And it's because to you, you're not just reacting to an itty-bitty issue. You're reacting to how it reminds you of things from the past. Things 
that you're still angry about that you've never resolved. And I just want to tell you, let me tell you two things about that. Number one, if you're that person who goes volcano over a simple discussion about something where you disagree, that's not fair to your spouse. And let me tell you something else. Number two, you are killing your marriage. You're killing your marriage. Men, we are riddled with testosterone. God gave it to us for fight or flight, right? Too often we allow that to rear up in our marriage and try to scream down our wife because we don't want to deal with it, because we have these unresolved issues that it's triggering in us. We have to be aware of this. We have to bring it down from nuclear, right? And have a civil conversation. It will change your marriage overnight. I know. I know. I didn't know I had a bunch of unresolved issues when I got married. Didn't even think about it. Nobody ever told me this. I never heard a message on it. I had unresolved issues. And I had testosterone. And I'm a good Christian boy. I was a very good Christian boy. But I had a temper. And there were times where I just didn't want to hear it. And I went volcano. Now, I will tell you, my wife did the best thing she could have done. One time I was so mad, and I remember yelling at her. This is probably our first year of marriage. I was like, I am so sick and tired of you. And she looked at me, and she goes, well, I'm sick and tired of you. That's true. That's true. She didn't ball up in a fetal position and act fearful. She just said, hey, I can do that too. Good woman. Good woman. It took me a while to get my temper dealt with. It took me several years and at least three counselors and a good wife who stayed with me. You need to get some closure, all right? You need to get some closure as you deal with the past. If you are a single adult here today, I beg you, and I mean that sincerely, I beg you, deal with your home and family issues. If you don't, you will carry them into your marriage. Okay. Do not carry guilt into your marriage. Don't carry grief into your marriage. Don't carry grudges into your marriage. But you're thinking, well, my grief, my grudges aren't against the person I'm marrying. Doesn't matter. If you've got grudges against somebody in your family, they get carried into your marriage. It's weird like that, but it's true. If you do, you are setting yourself up to move from harmony to hostility to apathy. You have to deal with unresolved issues. So please, right now, if you will, write down... Um, any unresolved issues that you have in your marriage. Those things that have to be dealt with if your marriage is going to be saved from sinking. Write it down right now. Let's hear the music. Unresolved issues. our fourth and final point for today. And by the way, we are going a little long. If uh, for some reason you, you know, you're getting antsy and you need to head out, please just head out quietly. I've got about five more minutes of preaching and then there's nothing after that. We're just going to wrap it up, okay? So just so you know, um, of course, we had a couple of extra things going on in the service today. So don't blame it on the preacher when you get out late. It's always the preacher's fault. Number four, the fourth iceberg that sinks a marriage is unforgiven hurts. And we have to cover this one. It's so vital. Unforgiven hurts will sink your marriage. Hurt that is swept under the proverbial rug and unforgiven causes barriers to build up between us. You don't forgive something, that puts a layer of brick 
You don't forgive something else, another layer of brick gets built. You don't forgive something else, another layer of brick gets built. And it just keeps building this wall between you when you don't forgive one another. It is unforgiveness that leads from hostility to apathy. Because we are imperfect, sinful beings, right? Can I get an amen? We are unperfect, sinful beings. We hurt each other. If you think your spouse is never going to hurt you, you're living in la-la land, right? I mean, it's just not true. Because you're sinful. We all are. You know, I mean, there's not a woman in the world I love more than my precious wife, but I've said things that have hurt her. I don't feel good about that. She's done things that have hurt me, right? She didn't necessarily mean to. I mean, maybe a few times in there. I don't know. You know but, you know, sometimes we do. Sometimes we take shots. We know it's going to hurt. And we do it on purpose because we're sinful. All of us are. And if you think that's completely unreasonable and you want to get rid of your spouse because of that, guess what? You have set yourself up for another failure because the next person you're with is going to do the same thing because the next person is a sinful human being just like you. Because we're imperfect, we sometimes hurt each other intentionally. Or unintentionally. We sin. We fail. We're selfish. So one thing you can count on in life is being hurt. One thing you can count on in life is being hurt. That, and you can count on hurting other people. All right? I've been a pastor for a long time, a lot of years. I've hurt people without having any idea that I hurt them. Sometimes they've been gracious enough to come and talk to me and say, Pastor, you know, that really hurt me when you said blah, 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 right? You know, and I'm just, I am so sorry. I did not mean that to hurt you in any way, shape, or form. And usually they were hurt because why? Unresolved issues, right? That's why we get so sensitive about things. Unresolved issues. But we're on issue number four right now, and that's forgiveness. The person who has the greatest potential to hurt you is the person who loves you the most. Write that down. Take a picture of it on the screen because it's absolutely true. I don't care what most people say about me. I care desperately what my wife says about me. That's why forgiveness must become a daily habit. Did you hear that? Forgiveness must be a daily habit. Every day we need to think before we close our eyes to sleep, Lord, is there anything today that hurt me that I'm holding on to? Lord, I need to forgive that. Most of the time, you never have to say anything to anybody else. You just forgive it in the name of Jesus. Okay? That's why forgiveness is a daily habit. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For what? Love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. If you don't let go of your hurts in marriage, those wounds will fester. And they will get worse and worse and worse. What is the worst sin in marriage? What is the worst sin in marriage? I know what you're thinking it is, but it's not that. It's not. The worst sin in marriage is actually unforgiveness. And let me tell you why. Unforgiveness is the worst sin in marriage. Because it's the one that holds all other sins captive. It's the one that holds all other sins captive. It's the one that won't let go. And here's another thing. It's also highly hypocritical. Highly hypocritical. You've been forgiven by God. Do you know that? You have been forgiven of all of your sins. Do you realize that your sins, your words, your actions, your breaking of the commandments, the sins that you have committed in your life nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. You and I murdered the Son of God. Now tell me, tell me what your spouse has done to you 
that's worse than that. You have been forgiven by God, and God expects you to forgive others. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. That word as is a conditional clause. It means to the extent. God, forgive me to the extent that I forgive others. Say it like that, and boy, you'll be challenged, won't you? Forgive me to the extent that I have forgiven others. Man, that's challenging. When you hold on to your hurt, you prolong the pain. You don't make it better, you make it worse. If you are holding a grudge and using something that happened in the past to leverage over your spouse, you are the one who is destroying your marriage. Awfully quiet in here. I'm Pastor Daniel, and I'm your friend. I beg you to forgive, to let go. Nothing can destroy a marriage faster or more completely than unforgiveness. But let me say this. There is a caveat that needs to be said. Forgiving deep betrayal is a process. Forgiving deep betrayal is a process. It begins by acknowledging, God, I forgive. As you've forgiven me, I forgive. But you may have to say that over and over again for days, for weeks, sometimes for years. Deep betrayal is a process. Because I want to acknowledge the fact that as I'm pushing, and I am pushing, for people to stay married, to not give up, I also do not want to make light of those of you who might be in an abusive relationship. The scriptures are clear. You should not divorce except for marital unfaithfulness. That's what Jesus told us. Specifically, they're referring to adultery. Specifically, Jesus was referring to a sexual sin. A little more broadly, theologians have talked about this over the years, and most theologians agree that includes a spouse who has been physically abusive. You should not stay in a relationship with someone who constantly beats you down and who does not show any signs of wanting to work on it and change. At the very least, you need to be separated long enough to see if the person will work on the issues that are destroying your life. Okay? Have to say that. Have to say that. Let's take one more 15-second break. Please write down a hurt which you need to let go of and forgive. As we uh, wrap things up here, I know that some of you, you listen to this message and you're saying, (laughs) you know what, PD, you just described my marriage to the T. I mean, that is exactly what's going on. And can you honestly look me in the eye and tell me that there's any hope? And yes, I can honestly look you in the eye and tell you that there's hope. Because Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says... Amen. God raises the dead to life and creates new things. God raises the dead to life and creates new things. If God can raise a dead person, he can raise a dead marriage. It's his specialty. It's what he does. 
Mark and Grace Driscoll in their book, Real Marriage, wrote this very, very insightful um, paragraph that we're going to close with. The experts tell us that no less than 50% of all marriages end in divorce by year seven. All right, so your first seven years could very well be the most difficult years of your marriage. And by the way, if you leave that and start over, you just started the seven-year cycle again. Just to make that clear. If you have ever heard of the seven-year itch, it's apparently true. While there can be biblical grounds for divorce, the painful truth, I want you to hear this, the painful truth is that most marriages end simply because of selfishness on the part of one or both spouses. Selfish people who divorce without dealing with their selfishness then remarry only to repeat the first seven years of selfishness with another person and are more likely to divorce again. All the statistics show that second marriage is divorced at an even higher rate than first marriages. Why? Because a selfish person who changes spouses has not yet changed his or her heart. Get this. Statistically, this has been, been shown. It takes 9 to 14 years for a couple to become not entirely unselfish, but rather less selfish and begin to shift from me to we. Couples who hang in there by God's grace through those early first years, report having greater levels of marriage happiness. And couples married 35 years, I just love this, report 35 years or more, report the same level of marital happiness as a newly married couple. Folks, there is hope. There is a future. And our marriages are absolutely vital to the life of the church. Our marriages are vital. They are the foundation on which Christ is building his church. Your marriage is about something so much more than your life or your happiness. It is about legacy. It is about breaking the chains of the past. It is about sanctification, becoming more holy, more like Christ. It is about making the church, giving it a firm foundation. And you all know, you know me, I've talked about this before. If you're sitting here today and you've gone through a divorce and you're sitting here by yourself and you're thinking, man, I tell you what, that pastor's just beating the heck out of me up one side and down the other. No, I'm not. That's the devil talking to you. I'm not beating you up. I love you. I love you passionately. I love you with all the love of Jesus Christ in my heart. And nobody knows the pain you've gone through like you do. And the last thing I would ever want to do is heap pain on top of pain. So I want you to know everything I share with you is, to, is from this point forward. We say that about everything we talk about here. It's from this point forward. All the things I gave you today are to start working on from this point forward. They are never meant to cause guilt or to beat anybody up for what's happened in the past. Never. That's the devil's strategy. That's not Jesus' strategy. You cannot go back and make a brand new beginning, but you can begin now and make a brand new ending. Amen. So what sinks our marriage? Unrealistic expectations, unaccepted differences, unresolved issues, and unforgiven mistakes or sins. Let's bow together in prayer. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come to you, Lord, and we want to lift you up as our great God Almighty. Father God, I want to pray for our marriages here at Woodlands. God, I pray for those, uh, first of all, who have been married a long time and they've figured some of these things out. But Lord, every marriage needs work. Every marriage can get better. Every marriage can, can honor you and bring you more glory. So God, I pray for those, those who believe they're in a solid marriage. They've been married 10 years or more. And uh, Lord, they, uh, they, but I pray that you'll make those marriages even better. And that they will, each marriage, each couple will go through these four points given today, these four icebergs that sink marriages, and make sure that nothing is lingering out there that the devil can use to get a foothold. 
Father God, I pray for those who are in struggling marriages right now. I pray for those who are barely hanging on. I pray, God, that you will help them to go through these four icebergs together as a couple. And Lord, it will be difficult. And they're not going to change overnight, most likely, unless you decide by your Holy Spirit to simply zap them and change them, which I ask you to do that. That'd be great. But you probably won't because you want us to go through a process. You want us to learn how to be more godly. You want us to learn how to be more Christ-like. So you take us through a process. So, Lord, I pray for these couples that they will go through the process. They will go through the struggle. They will go through these four icebergs, God. And they will uh, find healing for their marriage. And they will find hope. As you, by your word, have promised, you can raise the dead. You can certainly raise a dead marriage. Father, I pray for people here today whose marriage is just completely broken. Their spouse has been... Their spouse has been unfaithful in many ways. Maybe they've been unfaithful sexually. Maybe they've been unfaithful in terms of not fulfilling their marriage vows. They've been unfaithful through cruelty. Lord, we know that those people that live lives of sin like that God, we know that they are hurting, and they're hurting deeply because hurt people hurt people. And God, I pray for those people who have caused such pain to their spouse. God, I know it's not their spouse's job to fix them. They can't. They've tried for years. They know that. They can't fix them. God, you've got to fix them. So God, I pray that you will protect those spouses who have been in danger who have been in trouble, who have been in such deep, deep pain, but they've had to let go because they can't fix their spouse, Lord. And they need you to do that. They need you to save their soul. So God, we pray their souls will be saved. And we pray that they would be broken and they would come to the foot of the cross and they would surrender their life to you It doesn't mean those marriages will be healed. They might be. We've heard of miraculous situations like that. But Lord, it's certainly the exception, not the rule. But Lord, I pray for those who have been hurt that they will be able to forgive. Because if they can't, if they don't, then in some ways it allows that abusive person to just keep abusing them all over again something I know all too well. And Father, for the single people here today, I pray that they will take these four icebergs and look through each one of them and that they will begin resolving the issues that are in their lives, issues from their past, issues from previous marriages, issues from family, and they will begin to resolve those issues, that they will begin to forgive, and that they will begin to experience the sanctification, the God-building process of their own life, Lord, so that when they meet that person, Lord, when they meet a person that they want to have a relationship with, Lord, they won't be bringing all that baggage of their past into that relationship, but rather they'll be able to start fresh, forgiven, forgiving, and with Christ always at the center. We pray your Holy Spirit over each and every person here, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up together. Folks, I will tell you, I do apologize. I'm looking at the clock. I had no idea. Um, And, oh, now you're looking at it. Now you had no idea. Um, And uh, hey, I guess that's what I get for being gone for six weeks. Got a lot to say, right? Hey, um, we're back on next week. We're going to continue looking at Luke. I got a great message.